So I thought, what is the most, what's the most exciting book I could possibly do that'll be sure to hold everyone's attention once a month on Sundays? And so I thought to myself, of course, it's Deuteronomy. So, so we're going to do Deuteronomy and it'll be great fun. It's one of my favorite books of the Bible. I love Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. Um, we're basically going to start in chapter four, but Deuteronomy is Moses. They are at the, they are at the edge of the, um, they're on the east side of the Jordan River. They are getting ready to cross over into the land that God has promised them. And if you don't know what this looks like, I will show you. I will remove the Zoom screen from there and I will put this up in its place so you can see. So I'm going to zoom in here. This is way out, this is far out, but we're gonna start Deuteronomy one, but we're basically gonna skip over to four pretty quickly. So, so if you see for Alec, I'll see if I can simultaneously share the screen and cast it over there too, which I should be able to. No, I don't think so, okay. So sorry, you guys online can't see the map. I'll show it to you in a minute. So, um, okay, this is Israel. The Jordan River is here. I'm, I'll zoom in in a second. I'm just giving you the bird's eye view. The Jordan River is here. East is over here. This is the wilderness area where there's a lot of desert and a lot of other things. Israel itself is here. This is the land that God promised them. Now the Israelites, the Israelites are here. They're on this side of the river. This is the Jordan River, okay? They are on this side of the river and they're about to cross over the river and the first city they hit is going to be Jericho once they pass over. That's in the early chapters of Joshua. But they've been wandering in the wilderness for a long time. They've gone all over the place. Mount Sinai is down here. So they've wandered here. They've gone through the desert for 40 years. They have made their way up here and had their encounters with different kings. Uh, along the way who um, have not allowed them to pass through. They've had some battles. They've fought against city-states and they find themselves finally here and they're going to cross the river. And as they gather at the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river, they gather right here and Moses gives them a long series of sermons, which is the book of Deuteronomy. So I will remove this from there and zoom screen back. So that is where they are and what's, um, what's going on. Moses starts Deuteronomy with the first three, but the first three chapters is him reminding them of their history, of all their travels, and all of his grace and goodness and everything that he's done for them. But he starts, uh, starts in verse uh, in chapter four really talking about his message. But he starts by reminding them, um, starting in chapter one, how, you know, really close to the beginning, he realized he couldn't, he couldn't lead all the people himself. So he appointed leaders to, sub-leaders to sort of help him deal with all the issues that all the people have while they're in the wilderness and wandering around to maintain their society and their, their, their um, uh, laws and statutes while they're out there wandering around. And then he starts in chapter one, verse 19, he starts reminding them of how they got to this point. They got to the land a long time ago and they started, they sent spies to scout out the land and uh, they came back and everyone didn't trust God enough. They were too terrified to actually go into the land. He reminded them of the penalty that God gave them. Well, now you're everyone from this generation who's too afraid to trust me enough to go in to take the land that I've given you on the west side of the Jordan River, none of you are gonna go into the promised land. And so starting in chapter two, we have this, this recounting of some things that happened during the wilderness years. And then going into chapter three, he's reminding them of more recent history about how as the 40 years starts coming to an end and they're making their way to the, um, just, just, north of the um, just north of the Dead Sea to cross over the Jordan River, how they, conquered several small city states who wouldn't let them just pass through and everything else. And he says all of that to remind them of God's goodness and grace. He's been so patient with them through so much. And with that background in their mind, 
in chapter four, he really starts his sermon. And how many of you guys have heard a teaching series through Deuteronomy? You have? Well, we, used, we did in our church a long time ago at a previous church. You guys have been going here for 40 years though, right? So it must have been a long time ago you heard it. Okay. All right. Yeah. Deuteronomy. Has anyone else been through Deuteronomy before? How many of you guys have read Deuteronomy? Like recently? Yeah. Yeah. Deuteronomy is not the most popular book that ever uh, existed. I really love it because it's a book full of um, God's grace. It shows you his heart. It shows you a lot of things about God and about salvation. Jesus quotes in Deuteronomy a lot lot which means it's not some obscure uh, book and it shows us it shows us God's heart for why we should obey him and because a lot of Christians don't read the law or read Deuteronomy as much as they do other parts of the Bible it's hard to it's it's sometimes hard to visualize what an Old Testament saint's life is like and we talked about that when we were going through Hebrews we paused for two weeks and talked about that very topic Reading Deuteronomy, studying it together will help us really see what an Old Testament saint's life in walk with the Lord is supposed to be like. So that's why it's a helpful, helpful book. So I'm going to pray, and we're basically just going to start in chapter four. I'll ask for volunteers, and we'll read not the whole chapter at a time. We'll read long sections and talk about them and just move on and go through the book like this once a month until we're, until we're finished. This won't be a verse-by-verse -verse thing that takes 10 years. This kind of book isn't meant for a verse by verse uh, discussion. Uh, so we'll pray and then we'll take a look and see what, what Deuteronomy can tell us about living a faithful life uh, for God. So let's pray. Dear Lord, we come to you today in Jesus' name. Lord, help us to learn from your uh, word. Help us to learn from the book of Deuteronomy. Help us to learn principles about what it's like to love you and to serve you. And help that to have an impact on our life today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Starting in chapter four. What's up? I thought we were going to be in First John today, but I just happened to be reading there, <clears throat> and what you're saying coincides with the second chapter and the end of First John, talking about walking in the yeah. light, walking in righteousness. So I guess this is the Old Testament version of what the New Testament is talking about. That's actually true. I mean, that that the principle. Well, first of all. First John is Demetrius' thing, so I don't want to steal a whole teaching session from him. He already prepared for it, then he forgot he had drill this weekend. So I said, well, I'll just do, I'll do something else. But, you know, the principle that John talks about, if you, if you claim to be in the light, then you need to walk in the light, or you're deceiving yourself. Now, that's not a John thing. That's here in Deuteronomy. That's a God thing. If you love God, you're supposed to, you know, show it. Maybe you're not perfect, but you're, it's supposed to, you know, it should inform the way you live your life. And that's, that's all over Deuteronomy. So who wants to read? Can someone volunteer to read chapter 4, verses 1 through 8? All right, go ahead. Now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I am teaching you to perform, so that you may live and go in and take possession of the land which the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord has done in the case of Baal Peor. For all the men who follow Baal Peor, the Lord your God has destroyed them from among you. But you who held fast to the Lord your God are alive today, every one of you. One through eight, yeah. Oh, sorry. See, I have taught you statutes and judgments, just as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do thus in the land where you are entering to possess it. So keep and do them, for that is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the people who will hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as is the Lord our God Whenever we call on him. For what great nation is there that has statutes and judgments as righteous as this whole law, which I'm setting before you today? Okay. So I mean, how would you guys sum up what Moses is saying just in the first eight verses? Or give me one thing that he says. 
or something you have a question about. Okay, yeah, bail. Yeah, yeah, Baal Peor. That is, that's an infamous incident in the Old Testament. It's at Numbers chapter 15, where the Israelites are in the, they're, they're in the wilderness, and they're encamped there. And they start um, having, they start intermingling with the, the, the Midianite um, people who are near where they are. And the Midianite people are into um, these this fertility god uh, cult thing that I've mentioned before. Does anyone does everyone remember the fertility god thing that I've talked about? Does anyone want me to talk about it again to remind us? Because I know we all think a lot about fertility gods. Were they all having like sex? That yeah, was pissing God off. Yeah, the the thing the thing is is that you know they the whole world revolved around you know crops. If you're well, farmers today, like in the Midwest, their life still revolves around crops. You know, if your if your crop doesn't produce, then life is terrible for you and your family and for the, the your whole community, right? And so, what the the Canaanites, a whole bunch of a whole bunch of tribes in the area of Canaan had developed their own versions of this, and they all had different sorts of gods. But the generic idea was is that they tied um, their how well their their crops were to how pleased their gods were with them, and they they somehow amalgamated this idea of um, the rain coming from God, meaning God's favor. But they sexualized it so the rain coming from God, where it was God, where the gods uh, being excited, and you can connect the dots. God became God became ex, the gods became excited and poured down rain upon the ground, and they produced crops. So in order to entice God to continue to bless you and give rain so you have good harvest, you need to make sure that God is um, excited. So you continue, so you, you just, so the religious acts, some of them were basically you had cultic prostitutes at the temple and you just had as much sex as you possibly could with the cultic prostitutes to excite God to give rain and bless your crops. That's why in, in the Old Testament, you'll see things about um, cultic prostitutes, male and female cultic prostitutes. Um, and at Baal Peor, that's an incident where um, the Israelites were, were having relations with these Midianite cultic prostitutes. God became very upset and he told them not to do it and to stop. And as they're all, as a huge crowd of people are gathered at the tent, at the tabernacle, because there was no uh, you know, temple then, they're gathered at the tent, uh, praying and repenting. This one guy sneaks away with the Midianite prostitute into his tent during this exact time when everyone's gathered around to ask God for forgiveness. And this priest, Aaron's grandson named Phineas, he's so angry at this guy's blasphemy that he goes into the, he, follow, he sees what happens, he grabs his spear, he follows them into the tent, and as they're literally in the act of love, he, he impales both of them on the spear and kills them. Um, and Phineas is celebrated as this righteous guy who really loved God and um, um, ended these this Israelite who had so little regard for God that within sight of the tabernacle where God was dwelling, he took a Midianite prostitute into his tent. Um, so that that's an infamous like landmark incident of evil and wickedness uh, at at Baal Peor. So that's what that's talking about. So verse one, listen to the statutes and the rules that I'm teaching you and do them that you may live and go in and take position of the possession of the land the Lord, the God of your fathers is giving you. What is he, is he talking about salvation or is he just talking about living? You guys say living? Yeah, he's talking about living. Uh, like in, um, he's talking about, listen, you guys claim to love God. You should actually do what he says so that he'll bless you and he won't end your life. He won't curse you. You won't get sick and die. You won't have things that happen to you. We want to read this and think about salvation, but that's not what he's talking about. Is there a passage in the New Testament that gives this impression of when God is, when you deliberately, if you're a believer and you deliberately disobey God, that God might take your life? Is there a passage of the New Testament that talks about that? Well, 
from the text of your bias. Okay. Ananias and Sapphira. Yeah. Okay, so there's that. That's a good one. Ananias and Sapphira who sold their land but only gave a portion of what they got for sale but told everyone that it was everything they got for sale. Um, what, what's another example? Just so we know this isn't a weird Old Testament thing. The idea that if you, you claim to love God, but you don't, you don't show it in any way. You, 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 know, you denigrate God by the way you live, that he might end your life prematurely. What about 1 Corinthians 11, where he talks about the Lord's Supper? Where he says, some of you who blasphemed the Lord's Supper have already passed away. Some of you are already dead. Does anyone remember that passage? In 1 Corinthians 11, 23, Paul's talking about the Lord's Supper. The Corinthians aren't observing it well. People are showing up drunk to the Lord's Supper. Apparently at that time, it was some sort of potluck thing. They, they had some sort of meal as a church family and they celebrated the Lord's Supper. And it had become this debauch where you know people were just getting into drunken stupors and celebrating the Lord's Supper. And they're bringing tons of food, but then they're not sharing it with the poor people in the congregation. It's like they bring this big crock pot and then their own family just eats it. And a guy who has nothing but half a peanut butter and jelly sandwich just sits there thinking, are you planning on sharing with me? And it's like this weird, there's no love, you know? And in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, 23, not 23, um, where is it? Where is it, Ralph? Help me. <laughs> ah, okay, 30. So he talks about the way the Lord's Supper should be observed. And he says, whoever therefore eats, I'm in verse 27, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That's why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. Do you guys think that kind of thing still happens today? Yeah, I, was, I was in this program, it was a, it, a prison program for, um, but it was a Christian one. Yeah. And a lot of the people that were going in there were end the line drug addicts coming out of prison and stuff like that. And I watched a lot of them. Like, you could see that they had a sincere moment um, in the program where God was with them, but then they turned from it at one point in the program, and, and a lot of those guys died. Really? I watched them die, and um, they, most of them died by overdoses. Some of them got murdered. You know, the guys that re that that rejected God. Um, a lot of these guys in the program were dead, and I still hear about them dying off. Like after like years after the, the program ended because we keep track of each other on Facebook. But, okay, yeah. Um, one by one, they go back into their addiction and then they're gone. And so I, I do believe that if you are a Christian and you, and you choose to continue on in your, in your sinful ways, that eventually, uh, not even that God will take you, is that your own sinful actions will take you. Mm. Yeah, I, I think that's really important. And, you know, it, it's not as though God's like, I mean, we need to square this with the rest of scripture. It's not as though God's heart is, if you mess up once, I'm taking you out. I think what God's heart is, he's just making a generic statement that eventually, eventually, if you, if you belong to the Lord and you're, you don't follow him, it could get to the point where God just simply lets your, lets your sin take you. It's not as though you're walking down the street and one day he just God strikes you with a lightning bolt and you die, but maybe something will happen to you. Maybe you'll get sick. Maybe God will stop protecting you from the consequences of your own actions and your sin will take its course and you'll pass away. You won't live the kind of life you were supposed to live. Maybe you'll be sick for a long time. Maybe, I, I don't know, but the point is, is that God, God can remove his hand and, and, and let us suffer the consequences of our own actions if we continue to ignore him. So you, you just started that by saying a Christian who belongs to the Lord. So is it like, are you saying like a mercy? Like maybe that guy in the tent was a Christian, but he was like 
just in sin, and God's like, okay, enough. You clearly can't handle it. I'm bringing you home because uh, yeah. you're a believer. Yeah. We just don't know. We don't know about that guy's state. You know, I, I'm everyone. I, I, the impression I get from the Old Testament is no one thinks that guy's a believer. Um, so who knows? The point is, is that um, the point is, is that if you claim to know God and you continue to not listen to Him, it may get to the point where He just lets lets you suffer the consequences of your own actions Amen. and ends you. Yeah, I mean that's what I was doing. And I, God, I knew. <laughs> I knew in my heart God wanted me to quit smoking, but I just, it was just something I couldn't let go. And I'm like, what reasoning with him, you know? Mm -hmm. And gee, what happened? I got a lung cancer and lost part of my lung and I got it twice. I had to do chemo and radiation. So I learned my lesson. Uh, you don't ignore God. <laughs> You don't bargain with him when he wants you to do something. And um, I, I just didn't feel that it was hindering my walk with him. Um, yeah, I'd sit on the back porch, have a cigarette, and totally praise him. And I felt fine about it. And, um, yeah, he had other feelings. So I learned my lesson. <laughs> First John 5, uh, 16. Yeah. It's kind of a hard way. I just not want to. First John 5, 16. Yeah. Now, what is it? You can read it. When anyone sees his brother or sister committing the sin of leading to death, he shall ask, and God will, for him, give life to those who commit not sin leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I'm not saying that he should pray for that. Prayer for that one. So. A sin leading to death. I mean, all sin leads to death, but I think this would be a pretty, pretty bad one. So there is a sin leading to death, not meaning that you lose your salvation, but that God will take you out. I guess. Yeah. Blaspheming the Holy Spirit or something. That's different. <clears throat> yeah, First John 5 16 and 17 is really difficult, so I'm just going to ignore it right now. <laughs> 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 Thanks a lot, Ralph. <laughs> no, don't tear it out. No, don't tear it out. Um, I just don't want to spend all my time because uh, I, I haven't, uh, I don't know what to say about it off the top of my head. But um, what I do know about, um, about Deuteronomy is God is telling, Moses is telling him, listen, God has given you law. He's told you how he wants you to live and worship him. And this is for your own good, not because I'm mean or not because I'm some evil taskmaster. Uh, this is this is for your own good that I'm giving you these things. And Moses, you have to picture Moses pleading with them. God says, God says, listen to them so you can live and take possession of the land. Please remember them when you get into the land. He's going to talk about teach them to your children. He says, yeah, like, uh, uh, Janine mentioned Baal Beor in verse uh, Deuteronomy 4, verse 3. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did at Baal Peor. For the Lord your God destroyed from among you all the men who followed the Baal of Peor. That's the specific fertility God that was the problem at that area. But you who held fast to the Lord your God are all alive today. See, I've taught you statutes and rules as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do them in the land that you're entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples, who, when they shall hear all these statutes, will say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Why does God want, why does God want us to do what he says, to follow his word? It's about the same thing. Other people. Yeah, other people are going to see it. That's the, I mean, we're supposed to because we, we love him. You know, we're, if we love him, we should do want to do what he says. But another reason is so that the people around you can see you and say, I wonder about this God these guys are serving. You know, this isn't some New Testament thing where let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father who's in heaven. Matthew 5. That's not a Jesus thing. That's a Deuteronomy thing. That, that's what he says in verse 6, keep them and do them, 
for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God to us whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? So evangelism, right? Evangelism. That's one reason for living the way God wants Christians to live so that people can see it. And we sometimes downplay that like, it, you know, because it's just, it's all passive. There's no like action going out like some disciplined force to evangelize the community. You know, there's a place for that, especially in the New Testament. But here it's just live in a godly way so that people will see it. And then they'll wonder about what kind of God you serve. For example, today, well, I have two of my working years, I worked around uh, a lot of ungodly people and stuff. The language is pretty heavy, most of you have, <clears throat> but they noticed that I didn't, I wasn't using that kind of language or joking about all the jokes they could bring up. So they would yeah. come up and ask me, how come you don't do that? So that, and that was one example that I kind of caught on early that uh, people are watching you. And if you're following, <clears throat> following God, you're not, like everybody else, they're going to be curious and they're going to ask. You know, which led to some other things, but uh, that's just one example. <clears throat> so already, the reason why Deuteronomy is so special is already within, you know, just eight verses, we can see things that are in the New Testament that aren't New Testament things. They're Old Testament things. Matthew 5.16 is basically Deuteronomy 4. Six. Then he says, uh, does someone want to read verses 9 to 14? Some intrepid soul. Uh, uh, 9 to 14. Chapter 4, verses 9 to 14. <clears throat> Thank you, Shar. Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart. All the days of thy life, but teach them to thy sons and thy sons' sons. The next yeah, through verse 14. Especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord, thy God, in Horeb. When the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. And he came near and stood under the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire. Unto the midst of heaven with darkness, cloud, and thick darkness. And the Lord spake unto you out of the midst of the fire, he heard the voice of the words, but saw no similitude, only he heard a voice. And he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you before, even ten commandments, and he wrote them upon two tables of stone. Keep going. Last verse, yeah, 14. And the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments that ye might do them in the land whither you go over to possess it. Okay. Where in verse, if you look at verse 9, where does God's law, where is God's law supposed to be? Like, wh where is it supposed to reside? It's not in the heart. <clears throat> your, yeah, your heart. <clears throat> He, it's not supposed to be this. Um, it's not supposed to be this external thing. It's supposed to be something that that sticks in your heart, and because it's in your heart, then you want to do what he says. So how different? So do you see why Jesus was so um, upset at the the Pharisees who? added a whole bunch of, you know, the Pharisees uh, thing was we need to, after they came back from exile, they saw as, you know, bright people, the, the, the scribes and priests in Ezra's day, when they came back from exile, they saw that, well, we messed up because we didn't do what God said. So one way to make sure we don't do what God says is we need to go above and beyond and do more than God's, maybe a little 
stricter than what God says to make very sure that we don't mess things up. And so you thought, you know, so they made all these rules that piled on top of the actual law. What is it, you know, we're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. Well, define work. What's it mean to work on the Sabbath? So now they have to have rules about what is work and what isn't work because, you know, Deuteronomy and Numbers and Exodus, they don't say what work is. So it was this, it was this really legal view of trying to figure, th- it's like writing laws now. It's like, like in, in my job as an investigator with the, I run an investigation you know, with a state agency. When we look at laws to see if, you know, this company is violating the law, it comes down to definitions. You know, what is a contract? What is, in, what, is in, what is insurance? You know, wh- what do these words mean? And so you have, what does work mean? So you have all of these things piled up on top of what God's word actually says. And so you end up with this accumulated junk. So verse two says, you shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it that you may keep the commandments of your Lord. And in verse nine, he assumes that God's word should be in there, in your heart. See, that's not a New Testament thing either. That's an Old Testament thing. God's always wanted his people to do what he says because they love him. So back in the Old Testament, they were adding to it like they are, like they did in the New Testament. The, the people were adding to, um, I, or the priests, who was adding to the Pharisees? Did they have Pharisees back then? No, or no. Or Pharisees are a new, new Testament? Yeah, what I was the saying. Priests, is what I think they had in the Old Testament. Yeah, so what I was saying was after they came back from exile in, uh, my numbers are getting away from me, in the early 500s, you know, they come back from exile leading into the, 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 the 400s, the late 400s, you have Ezra and Nehemiah who led the people back at different times. And Ezra in particular is teaching the people. And Ezra was the start of this, the people who came after Ezra started to interpret the law really legalistically to make sure that they didn't lead the people to mess up again. And so you ended up having all these legalistic rules built up around the law to make it so people wouldn't transgress the law again. And so instead of being what ended up, you know, a few hundred years down the road by Jesus's day, is that a lot of the people were taught since they were kids that a relationship with God was very legalistic, very rules-based. But in verse nine, you see God assuming that his law is in people's hearts, which is a lot different than having a list of rules about what is work and what isn't. And, you know, you know, to make this real, there were, there were like insane legalistic rules about what work was on the Sabbath. Like it wasn't a work, it wasn't work to carry a loaf of bread from one. It was, it was work if you carried a loaf of bread from one house to another by yourself. But if another guy carries it with you, then it's not work because you're splitting the loaf. Now, does that sound dumb to you guys? Yeah. But that, that was real. I'm serious. Like it's real. So like that, that atmosphere that the Pharisees had helped cultivate along, among a lot of the people. Like knowing God means I follow these rules. Where's the heart in that? Where's the heart in, hey, bro, I need you to hold this other loaf of bread, the other half of this loaf of bread so I can walk to your house. It was a subway, you know, hokey uh, sandwich. Yeah, but, yeah, but if, you got, if you got the six inch, could you carry it yourself? Yeah, right. What if you got the six inch and you had them split it at the restaurant? So... And there's other things too, like you couldn't tie more than a certain number of, you couldn't sew more than a certain number of stitches. Like so down, so nitty gritty that it makes you sick to read it. But that's why Jesus is so mad. That's why when the Pharisees saw Jesus' disciples picking grain on the Sabbath, they said, you're working. And his response was, you guys, they'd be sick. What happened to heart? You're going around with this nasty interpretation that's really legalistic. When God never said I couldn't pick a thing of grain on the Sabbath. That's not working. I'm literally walking by 
and picking a thing of grain. That's work, really? My point is in verse 9, all the way back in the Old Testament, God assumes that his law is not this external, his law is not this guillotine hovering over you. It's something that's in your heart because you love it. And what does he want them to do in verses, uh, the last part of nine in verse 10? What chapter? Um, four. Teach your kids. Tell your kids about this. And not just teach them. Teach them how God loves us. Teach them that God rescued us and then he brought us to the mountain and he made us his very special people. Teach your kids how God chose us and loves us. Not make sure they know the rule about two guys need to carry a loaf of bread on the Sabbath to avoid working, to avoid the religious police, you know? Those are two really different ways of looking at the Christian life, looking at the believing life. Yeah, he want, he really, um, just at the very beginning of chapter four, we're already seeing echoes of the same New Testament stuff that, that, uh, that Jesus taught. His words in your heart, his words should be hidden in your heart so that you might not sin against God. That's a Psalm 119 thing. That's not Jesus. No, or living it. There was a book he maybe read a long time ago. It said none of these diseases written by a doctor who's looking at Hebrew law and how the Hebrews lived to their eating rules and rules for eating, rules for cleansing themselves, touching dead bodies, and all these things. And actually, when they obeyed those laws, uh, they didn't get sick. They didn't get the diseases that all the countries around them get by touching these right. things, by washing their hands before they eat, or Eating the foods that God told them to eat, uh, they were able to uh, actually prosper physically, uh, healthily. Uh, that's just another aspect. If they were following the statutes, and those were put on them. Not the ones about sin, but mm -hmm. at least following good uh, hygiene. Uh, let me see. Okay, um, let's do, does someone want to read 15 to 24? I will. Okay. If you saw no form of any kind the day the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the fire, therefore watch yourselves very carefully so that you do not become corrupt and make for yourselves an idol, an image of any shape, whether formed like a man or a woman, or like any animal on earth, or any bird that flies in the air, or like any creature that moves along the ground, or any fish in the waters below. And when you look up to the sky and see the sun, the moon and the stars, all the heavenly array, do not be enticed into bowing down to them and worshiping things the Lord your God has apportioned to all the nations under heaven. But as far, but as for you, the Lord took you and brought you out of the iron smelting furnace out of Egypt to be the people of his inheritance as you now are. The Lord was angry with me because of you. And he solemnly swore that I would not cross the Jordan and enter the good land the Lord your God is giving you as your inheritance. I will die in this land. I will not cross the Jordan. But you are about to cross over. 
and take possession of that good land. Be careful not to forget the covenant of the Lord your God that he made with you. Do not make for yourselves an idol in the form of anything the Lord your God has forbidden. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Okay, what's, what's the gist of what he wants here? Okay, why would they create idols? Like we don't create idols now. Why would they create idols then? Good one. <laughs> it's too much idle time. I like that. Whatever they, it's just like it is for us. It's whatever we put before God is our idol. And they are actually making wooden statues and evil things to worship. But it's just as bad as us putting something before we put God. Well, the one in verse 19, what do you think they could throw at something? Yeah, I mean, we can, it's easy to get, you know, um, you know, to brush by this as some old, old weird thing that doesn't have anything to do with us. But in their time, you know, the, the thing was in their area was they made gods of physical things, wood and stone and, and um, worship the stars in the heavens and, and not because they're stupid people, but because that's just their culture was a lot different. We do a lot of weird things in this culture that one day people will probably look at and wonder what on earth we're what on earth it has to do with anything. Um, why is it called dressing up if I wear a piece of polyester that pretends to be silk around my neck? Why does that make me dressed up? I mean, what purpose does it serve? Who decided a strip of fabric with a nice color around my neck makes me dressed up? It doesn't even make any sense. What's its purpose? So our culture has weird things. We just don't, we don't think they're weird. But he's warning them, you know, I don't have a physical form. So don't make any don't make any representation of me because that was a thing then it was a, a danger then because if you make that thing that represents God soon you can be worshiping that thing as God. Some people don't even think you should have pictures of Jesus at all because Jesus is is God, our God is Father, Son, and Spirit. So we shouldn't make any representation of Jesus whatsoever, or perhaps even the Holy Spirit. But how can we make how can we, how does idolatry work today? Like, I don't think any of you guys, some of you might have, some of you guys might have idols of stone in your house, but in the, in the modern West, I don't think that's a big issue. In other cultures, it might be. But I mean, we don't have a problem with making physical representations of God and worshiping them. What, what are our problems? I feel the same because I go over to a lot of people's houses to do work and I see they have idols in their yards, like, the Buddhist statue, the Buddhist statue mm -hmm. and the, and, you know, they don't have Jesus up. They have all these other gods in their yards. And so I think it still goes on today. People are rejecting God because he uh, judges everybody and they choose these easier, softer gods that don't have uh, certain things you have to do for them. You can kind of do what you want. Yeah, I guess the, I guess the distinction would be I don't think that, well, they might. I mean, there might be other ones in the house, but I don't think people who have a Buddha in their front garden are going out and worshiping the Buddha in the morning. Um, they might have some in their house. He's talking about making idols that they actually worship as God or that they think represents gods. How do we do that? How do we, how do we make idols out of God today in our culture? Well, we worship rock stars, Elvis. Still, uh, but a lot about today because he's the king of rock and roll. But if you go down to where he lives, his the mansions there, the thousands of people below that they still mourn his death. Have you been to Graceland, we Rob? We you went there too. We didn't you worship. Okay. We looked at his gold albums and gold records and all of his fancy suits. But if you go over. Day on TV, you got American Idol. Look, it says it right there. They're trying to produce people who will be followed by, by the masses. Oh, right. they, they idolize these people. It's not, and some of them probably even worship them. Maybe not as God, but mm -hmm. they give all their attention to that versus. Uh, 
like husbands or spouses or children or material possessions? I think it could be a lot of things. I think I think one I think one way besides what Ralph said is that we we like to we like to change God into someone who just affirms whatever we want. Instead of worshiping the real God, we call him God, but we can just sort of craft him into whatever we want him to be. So we, we end up having a God who mysteriously affirms everything we want to be and everything we want to do. There's no sense of, if I belong to God, he changes me. There seems to be this unspoken sense among a lot of people that where God mysteriously seems to like everything about them and everything they are and everything they want to be. There's no sense of God needs to change me to be more like him. It's more God just mysteriously seems to like everything about me just as I am. God changes to look like me instead of the other way around. And you see that with sexual confusion in our society. Identity confusion, where your sexual preferences are your identity. It is who you are instead of who you are is what God says. You're a child of God or you're not. That's the status. That's the identity that God says everyone has. You either are a child of God or you should become a child of God. But the status now is more, the identity marker now is more something like um, what I feel is what I am. I feel that I'm a woman. So I'm, I demand to be acknowledged as a woman. And Mysteriously, for those who want to who want to claim to be Christian and do that, God becomes not a God who loves us and welcomes us into his family and then changes us to look like him. Instead, it's God just just so happens to like every single thing about me just as I am, and I don't need to change anything. <laughs> we make God in our image. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's what I was. You're really good at summarizing things I try to say much better than I. And we make God in our own image. Yeah, that's good. I, mean, uh, I, I, I do a program where uh, you get to choose your own God, your own conception of your own higher power. Okay. And a lot of, uh, a lot of the people in there choose their own conception of a higher power because they don't like the Bible. They don't like Jesus because of him condemning the gays or mm -hmm. condemning... Uh, them of whatever sin that they want to do so they they choose this new higher power and then they make up with this higher power uh, this higher power uh, accepts and and uh, loves about them um, basically they, they they get to make their own higher power and my higher power they'll, they'll always say my higher power wouldn't do that to me or my higher power would yeah. do this and so my higher power is only love and, yeah yeah and that's I watched all these people just get just get watered down. Like the, the words lost, they choose their own higher powers, and they're as sick as they were as they walked in the front mm -hmm. door. They're, I mean, you can see it in their actions. It's, but that's a lot what the whole world does is this these days too, is they choose their own conception of their own higher power, which makes it okay for them to do the things they want to do, be the way they want to be. I was talking to, and we're out of time, but I was talking to a guy, I was talking to a guy and his wife yesterday, and um, they're not Christians, and um, the guy was telling me, a really, really nice guy, um, and I'm not saying that it's easy to like demonize people who are outsiders as though they're stupid, or they're all evil people, you know, making effigies of God and stabbing him in the face. This is a nice guy, a good guy, and he's talking about how he doesn't, he respects a lot of what Jesus has to say, but he sees a lot of truth in a bunch of religions. And he says that he thinks everyone needs to choose, everyone needs to choose what is best for them, which speaks to who they are. And it's all, I mean, he's really sincere, but it's all a me-centered approach. God is, you shop for God. You shop for a God. I mean, I like, I like Wendy's chicken nuggets better than McDonald's for many reasons. So I will not go to McDonald's, I'll go to Wendy's. And for searching for who do you want to worship and what is God like, it's a shopping, it becomes a shopping excursion where I need to choose what's best for me. And that, that seems to be, that is one big way about how we can 
People can claim to love God, but they make an idol out of him by changing him into something he's not. Has anybody ever said, my, how, my higher power hates your higher power and wants me to kill you? Is that fair? Yeah. Is that, that fair? People, <laughs> people it sounds harsh, but is it, would it be fair? Yeah. No. Or choose what's best for them could be, well, I follow the teachings of Hitler and what's best for me is to make sure I hate you mm -hmm. because uh, I don't hate you guys. And so that's best for me. So, I mean, would that be, is that becomes unfair? Yeah, it, it's, um, it becomes fair when you start doing that. Yeah, every, everyone does have a, don't like my, everyone does believe in absolute truth, whether they claim to or not. Um, we're already out of time and now we're over time. So I'm going to pray. And a month from now, we'll continue with Deuteronomy. It's exciting. Isn't Deuteronomy exciting? Look at the time has just flown away from us. So let's pray.